my name is Lee B. Thomas, Jr. I was born in Seattle. I was raised in, in around Chicago. And I moved to Louisville in 1954. I've been here since. I'm a business executive. I was the CEO of Vermont America for 24 years. And I was the chairman of the board for another four. And uh, I lost the takeover battle. I lost my extended family. I did win the law case, and so I got money. I was able to buy this place. And so I'm back in business. During the period that I was unemployed, I started teaching. First at U of L and then at Bellarmine. I'm executive in residence at the business school at Bellarmine. When it looked like I was going to lose everything I had, I put a block of Vermont American stock into a charitable foundation. I managed the assets of that foundation without a money manager. I find ethically run companies, invested in them, and stay there. And I beat the benchmarks. Because who do you want to do business with? Ethically run companies. <laughs> I understand that when you're talking about over 60 years ago and relying upon memory, there are bound to be inaccuracies. My dad was brilliant. He said, you don't finish high school. You go to college, and then you'll be drafted, and when you come back, they'll have to take you back in college, in spite of the fact that there'll be everybody else trying to clamor to get in. So I applied to Yale, which was way above my abilities. At that time at Yale, in order to get in, they looked in your ear, and if it didn't see light, you were in. <laughs> because all the men were in the service, and it was an all-men's school. And uh, I was drafted after my first term. I've written a book about business. And when I tell the story about that book, I say, My mother has to be laughing in her grave because I flunked freshman English at Yale cold. And when I was in the foxholes writing letters home, she'd correct them and send it back to me. And I thanked her for it. So I didn't write the book. I put it on the table and let professionals write it, even though I did get somewhat straightened out thanks to my mother. <laughs> Okay, so I'm drafted. I had a desk job with a lady. And uh, I got in trouble with my boss. And I was transferred to a company that was misfits. A lot of them were parolees from prison. And we were cannon fodder. Mm -hmm. We saw all the hate films about the Japanese. So we killed. Of course, I can't tell you for sure that I killed anybody. And neither can anybody else in war. Because everybody's shooting at the same people. Who's bullet in the job? You don't know. I don't know. But I have to assume that I killed. I said a prayer. Dear 
God. Those of us that need, those of us that served in the army have a special need for thy forgiveness and understanding. For we have killed thy children. For we are all thy children. Sixty-one years ago, this coming August the 6th, yeah. I was on Atlantic Craft Manpower, headed for the invasion of Japan. I was going to die. I knew it. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we were invited down into the hold of the ship to listen to the news of the bomb. It saved our lives. We had a hell of a party. We all got snooker. As soon as the surrender was signed by the Yokohama Harbor, Was on a train. Now, I think the train went directly to Hiroshima, but I'm not sure. I know I was in Hiroshima, but it was still war. You see, so it had to be certainly by the middle of September. So we're talking weeks, not months. The few people that were left, this I can remember vividly, the few people that were left had made lean to us. Because they, they didn't have a problem with uh, being too cold. And they put poked holes in the water main to the corners. Put wooden pegs in, take the peg out and catch the water. Of course it was all radioactive. None of us know it. Yeah. I wasn't there very long. So I have, I have, while I have taken precautions, the dentist doesn't take pictures of my teeth, but uh, I don't have any radiation damage that I know of. And I've made it to 80, to 80 years old now, so looks like it's okay. Uh, when I got prostate cancer, they were able to lose, use the little seeds because they're very local. But so, you know, I didn't really suffer anything here except spiritually. Seeing what happened to people. Seeing the enormous cost saving my life. In our occupation duty, I had more education than almost anybody in the outfit. So they put me in charge of the payroll for the Japanese working on the base. Now we're doing something right. We're putting some money back into the economy. We're paying people some of whom we didn't need. And we're paying them so that they get off the, the dole. Passing out checks, it's easy to make friends. <laughs> and all these hate films that we saw were false. We've been lied to by our own government. Because they're people. And I can still remember as vividly as if it was yesterday. An old Japanese gentleman out to Bushwick Bon Voyage as I was going home. It was about four o'clock in the morning. A human being.
when I came home, a mixed up guy. Went to work in a factory, waiting for school to start. back to Yale. My advisor turned out to be a guy by the name of White Bakke. W-I-G-H-T-B-A-K-K-E. He might have been the foremost expert on labor relations in the world. He was also a clerk of the Quaker meeting. He was what? Clerk of the Quaker meeting. Uh -huh. I got to attending Quaker meeting. And George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, was fond of saying, there is only one that can speak to the human condition, and that's the Christ within. I don't say it that way. I say that God within. I'm a little bit too Jewish. <laughs> but I got to appreciate this God within. And uh, there is only one that can speak to the human condition. get be 80 years old. We start thinking about the Great Divide. Is there some kind of an eternal spirit? Will there be some kind of union with that spirit? It's all a matter of faith. The only kind of immortality that we know for sure is that we leave of ourselves with those that succeed us. And it's up to us to take that that we've received from those that have passed on, build on it, and in turn leave it for those that come after us. That came from a rabbi. <laughs> I've done a lot of demonstrating for peace. And when there's a march of some kind that I think the, the uh, press is going to cover, I'll go down and I'll spot the, the uh, reporter. Would you like to talk to a business executive? <laughs> It wins of every time. <laughs> a business executive doing this? There's an incongruity here. Uh, I went to the counter coronation in Washington. Uh, but perhaps more important than that is I think I'll leave a legacy in business. Many years ago, there was a restaurant out on downtown. Best seafood restaurant you ever saw. Leo's Hideaway. On Saturday night, an African American couple came in, and Leo seated them. This was about 1958 or 9. A table of white folks got up and stormed out, calling the dirty word. Leo went and stood at the door, faced his remaining customers, and said, Well, my friends, I guess there's some business I just plain don't need. 
The next time we went in, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was on every table, and we had the first integrated restaurant law. I was not there the night that the African American couple came in. I read about it in the paper. But I was there the next night. <laughs> That's the preface to my book. Until you get to the point where there's some business you just plain don't need, you don't belong in business. And business run right can, in fact, help the world toward a more peaceful future. <laughs> Who do you want to do business with? Ethical companies. It's the way to make money. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it is. When I became a chief executive officer of that company, there were two things that we did. First of all, there was no question. You could make an economic mistake, learn from it. You make an ethical mistake, and you're out of here. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, we're going to be highly decentralized because people grow making decisions. And so I didn't build the company, the people did. But when I became the CEO of doing about $9 million a year, when I lost the takeover battle, it was in the Fortune Second 500. Four hundred and fifty million from nineteen fifty I mean nineteen sixty four I think it was to nineteen eighty nine. It worked. Oh, the Boy Scouts. <laughs> uh, we had an interdenominational Protestant church. And Dr. Cornell was a, a kind of a great man that I really respected. He was also our scoutmaster. And uh, we did a lot of camping, and, and uh, we also had a bowling alley in the basement of the church. And I said, pin that bowling alley, and you talk about ethics, business ethics. Look, Tim. Pins that fly out of our place, and here we are, these kids out there setting pins. Mm. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> but anyway, we got away with it. And, uh, but at uh, the interdominal, I think he was probably ordained in a, a, a Presbyterian, my guess is. destruction. I mean, you know, here was a, a major city, and it was just a few people on lean to left. It was just the enormity. Did you know something had changed in you at that time? Well, the point is, you see, that we all justified the, the bomb because of the saving of lives. Yeah. But we came to realize it was the saving of our lives, not the saving of lives in total. I had no idea whether, and incidentally, when we put our garbage cans out in occupation duty, the Japanese would dive in the garbage cans and eat raw garbage. They were starving. So we had three choices. Bomb, invade, or wait for hunger. Any way you went, the suffering would be enormous. There is no such thing as a just war. I could see that I was headed for the sideball religion. My parents were wonderful. I said, we disagree with you, but we know where you're coming from. We respect you. There's this 
divine presence within yourself that uh, you really don't want to disappoint. <laughs> share the tree. There's the woodpecker getting sustenance. The robin building a nest. Squirrels having a play day. The tree is very old. Maybe 200 years. But there's no growth. I'm fond of saying uh, to some of my uh, Orthodox Christian friends, don't you think that Jesus could have handled the money changers a little better than what he did? 